Okay, um, finite math students, this is definitely my last video for this semester. Uh, let me just close this. And, um, okay, this is Mr. Lewitt, obviously. And let's go over some of the questions in your test. Um, I don't know if we're going to have time to go over every single question because I don't want this video to become unbelievably long, um, you know, but let's do as much as we can do, okay? There are basically, um, there are 10 questions, there are 10 questions in your probability test. The first five questions have to do with Bayes' theorem. The, yeah, so the first five questions have to do with Bayes' theorem, and the last five questions have to do with um, expected value, <clears throat> um, probability and, you know, uh, probability, dis discrete probability distributions and the expected value of those discrete probability distributions, okay? Actually, you know what, before we start, let me do one thing over here. Uh, let's see, where's my virtual pen? There we go. Okay, let me just close this. Okay, and I think we're ready to go. Okay, so I'm looking at question number one. A manufacturer obtains clock radios from three different subcontractors. 10%, uh, let's see, 10% from subcontractor A, and 30% from subcontractor B, and 60% from subcontractor C. The defective rates for these sub the defective rates for these subcontractors are 3%, 1%, and 1% respectively. So 3% for A, 1% for B, and 1% uh, for C. If a defective clock radio is returned by a customer, what is the probability that it came from subcontractor A, or from subcontractor B, or from subcontractor C? Okay, here my dog. Here's my dog looking for attention. Okay, yeah, I can't give you a lot of attention right now because I got work to do. Okay, come on. Okay, I got work to do. You got to play by yourself. Okay. Um. We'll go out, oh, hold on one second. We're gonna go outside a little later, okay? We'll go out, I may have to pause the video and, oh God, the, the joys of working from home, okay? We're gonna go outside later. Uh, okay, so let's, okay, let me concentrate on the video if I can. Okay, so we're gonna go outside later, jump up. Jump up, Go out. we'll go outside later, jump up. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, we're going to try to concentrate on this video. I, okay, this is, yeah, working from home during this COVID pandemic has proven to be very, very difficult. I have to tell you, it's, it's, it's really difficult. <laughs> okay, so um, where are we here? Let's get back to what we're supposed to be working on. Um... Subcontractor A, and what was that? That was 10%. Okay, so 0 0.10. Okay, and subcontractor B, and that's equal to 30%. And then subcontractor C, and that's um, 60%. Okay. And let's see, the defective rates for these subcontractors are 3%, 1%, and 1%. Okay. So defective A is 3%. And defective B is 1%. And defective C is 
1%. <clears throat> okay, so we have to figure out the probability. And as always, you know, there's a numerator and there's a denominator whenever you figure out these probabilities. So the denominator for all three probabilities is going to be the same. Okay, so my denominator is going to simply be subcontractor A times defective A plus subcontractor B times defective B plus subcontractor C times defective C. So that's going to be the, the denominator that all three of these probabilities have. Okay, so it's simply going to be the product of the percentages of clock radios from each subcontractor times the percent of defective clock radios from each subcontractor. Okay, that's it. Okay, why is this not, this isn't subcontractor, Oh, I didn't spell this correctly, that's why. Sub, okay, hold on. Let's try that again. Okay, we're getting a regular number, which is good. Okay. Um, the numerator, that's going to depend on whether, you know, we're looking at subcontractor, subcontractor A or subcontractor B or subcontractor C. So, and it says here, round to three decimal places as needed. Okay, so number form, okay, subcontractor A times defective A divided by the denominator, infinity, Okay, so remember to use the keyword infinity here. This has to do with the number of significant digits, and of course infinity just means use as many significant digits as possible. That's what the keyword infinity here means. Um, if you use another digit, um, there, you're, you could eliminate you could end up eliminating some of your significant digits, which would not be a good idea, okay? So, and then three has to do, this number here has to do with the number of digits following the decimal point, okay? So this is going to be, this answer is 0 0.250, okay? And, oops. Let's copy and paste. And, uh, subcontractor B times defective B. Okay, and that's going to be, uh, let's see, shift enter. Again, that's going to be um, 0 0.250. Subcontractor C times defective C. Okay, and of course that's going to be 0 0.500 because the whole thing, all three probabilities have to add up to one. It should be correct. Okay, so that looks good. Your input is correct. Score 100%. Now bear in mind, guys, be very careful because um, my problem could be a little bit different from your problem. So this is not monkey see, monkey do, okay? This, oops. Ugh, wait a minute. Wait, let me do that one more time. <laughs> we are having technical difficulties here, so let me, okay, so let me, there we go, okay. It, this is not monkey see, monkey do, okay? Your problem could be a little bit different. 
your percentages, I mean, the problem will be very similar, but your percentages could be a little bit different. So instead of 10%, maybe you'll have 8% coming from subcontractor A. You know, instead of 30%, maybe it'll be 40% or 20% or 10%. Instead of 60% coming from subcontractor C, maybe you'll have 10% or 15% or 50%. Okay, these percentages here could also be different. <clears throat> Obviously, then, your answers are going to be different. So you can't just say, oh, well, Mr. Lewitt just gave me the answers to the test. If you do that, I guarantee you're going to have the wrong answers. Um, you know, you, okay, well, I'm talking to my dog now, guys. We'll go outside soon, okay? Not this minute. So you really have to look carefully at the problem and not just copy down the answers that I have here because if you just copy what I have I guarantee you know you're gonna fail the test <laughs> okay so the purpose of this video lecture is not to give you just a bunch of easy answers the purpose of this video lecture is to help guide you through the test so that everyone can do very well on the test but you still have to read the problems and figure out those problems using the data provided for you in those problems. Because remember, the exact data, the figures, the percentages, the numbers in your problems could be a little bit different from what I have. So think. Don't just copy, but actually think. Okay? That's, that's super important. Because if you're not thinking, well, you know, why are you in college, right? Okay, let's go on to the second problem. Okay, the second problem reads, a computer store sells three types of microcomputers, brand A, brand B, and brand C. Of the computers they sell, 60% are brand A, 25% are brand B, and 15% are brand C. They have found that 25% of the brand A computers, 10% of the brand B computers, and 10% of brand C computers are returned for service during the warranty period. If a computer is returned for service during the warranty period, what is the probability that it is a brand A computer, a brand B computer, a brand C computer? Okay, very similar, it's very, very similar to the last problem, okay? So, let's see, we have um, brand A is 60%, brand B Okay, one second. Of the computers they sell, 60% are brand A, 25% are brand B, <clears throat> and brand C, okay, 15%. Okay, service A, let me see, service A, they have found that 25% of the brand A computers, okay, so it's 25% brand A, 10% for brand B, Yeah, so 25% of the brand A computers, 10% of the brand B computers, and 10% of the brand C computers are returned for service during the warranty period. And usually, it depends on the warranty. Most, um, most computer warranties last for about a year. <clears throat> um, I know at Apple, you know, if you buy an Apple computer, 
you can purchase an extended warranty, and that's for three years. That's for three years, which is kind of nice. Okay, so again, we're going to have a denominator. And that's simply going to be, you know, brand A times service A plus brand B times service B plus brand C times service C. Okay, that's really easy. So brand A times service A plus brand B times service B plus brand C times service C. <clears throat> and that's really easy. So you're simply adding up, to, you know, you're, you're adding up the products of the brand A percentages times, you know, uh, sorry, uh, not the brand A. You're adding up the product of the brand percentages and the service percentages. I mean, it's really pretty simple. So let's see, number form, <clears throat> brand A times service A divided by the denominator. And that's infinity. Um, let's see, how many decimal places do they want? Three decimal places. Okay. So let's see, 0 0.789. Let's do a copy and paste, and then we'll do we'll do the same. Oh, okay, my dog my dog's gonna start going crazy here. Okay, <laughs> uh, brand B times service B. I'm gonna have to pause this. Oh God. Oh God. Okay. I'm going to have to pause the video at some point just to take him outside. So, okay. It is what it is. Okay, so brand B times service B divided by the denominator. So this is going to be 0 0.132. And we'll do the same thing for brand C. And then service C. Okay, 0 0.079, 0 0.079, okay, terrific. So looking at these numbers, looking at these values, I would say that the best of the three computers is probably brand C, but since only, um, yeah, since only 15% of the computers that they sell are brand C, my guess is that brand C, <clears throat> excuse me, my guess is that brand C is the most expensive of the three computers, which is why, you know, they don't sell a lot of them. But it's definitely the best of the three computers because, you know, look, look right over here. Um, only a few people bring in that computer to get serviced during the warranty period. You know, um, brand C computers are really good. They don't, they don't require a lot of service. So, you know, you get what you pay for. That's, that's especially true when it comes to computers. So I would, you know, I would buy a brand C computer. I would buy a brand C computer. Okay, let's see if this is correct. Okay, so your input is correct. Score 100%. Great, yay. Okay. <clears throat> okay, here's, here's a more complicated problem, but it's really the same idea. It's really, it really is the same idea. Um, a new simple test has been developed to detect a particular type of cancer. The test must be evaluated before it is put into use. 
medical researcher selects a random sample of 1,000 adults and finds by other means that 2% have this type of cancer. Each of the 1,000 adults is given the test, and it is found that the test indicates cancer in 97% of those who have it, and in 1% of those who do not have it. So this, this goes back to, you know, the false, the false positive, false negative results of medical tests. Medical tests are not 100% perfect. So let's read this again. Each of the 1,000 adults is given the test, and it is found that the test indicates cancer in 97% of those who have it and in 1% of those who do not. Based on these results, what is the probability of a randomly chosen person having cancer given that the test indicates cancer? Okay, hold on. Let me pause the video, guys, because there's a lot of noise going on in the other room, and I need... Okay, that's really annoying. Hold on. Okay. Okay, <laughs> let's get back to this. So for this problem, guys, you really don't need to know that we're dealing with 1,000 adults. Okay, all that matters are the probabilities or the percentages. So you could use the figure of 1,000, but it's really not necessary. So it says here, you know, each of the 1,000 adults is given the test. And like I said, it really doesn't matter how many adults here you have here. Okay, and it is found that the test indicates cancer in 97%, excuse me, the test indicates cancer in 97% of those who have it and in 1% of those who do not. Based on these results, what is the probability of a randomly chosen person having cancer given that the test indicates cancer, of a person having cancer given that the test does not indicate cancer. So again, you have to, you know, choose variable names that are appropriate for the problem you're working on. And this is one of the reasons why I like Mathematica so much, because you can store your data in variables and you can give those variables whatever name you like, okay? If you select variable names that are meaningful, then the problem suddenly becomes much more manageable and much easier to understand. Okay, so here, let's see. Um, okay, so here, according, okay. So cancer, yes, is 2%. Cancer, no is therefore 98%, okay? And then it says here, cancer, yes, test, yes, is equal to 97% or 0 0.97, okay? So therefore, cancer, yes, the test says no, is equal to 3%. And the person doesn't have cancer, but the test says the person, you know, the person doesn't have cancer, but the test says the person does have cancer. Um, that's going to be 1%. So therefore, cancer, no, test, no, must be 0.99%. I mean, I'm sorry, 99%, which expressed as a decimal, is 0 0.99. Okay, so let's figure out these probabilities. Okay. Based on these results, what is the probability of a randomly chosen person having cancer given that the test indicates cancer? Okay, so my denominator... Oops, did not. 
I can spell that. Denominator is equal to, um, and the test indicates cancer, right? So that's cancer, yes. Um, times cancer, yes. Test, yes. Plus cancer, no times cancer, no, but the test says yes. Given that the test indicates cancer, so according to the test, the person has cancer. Okay. Now the numerator is going to be, um, based on these results, what is the probability of a randomly chosen person having cancer given that the test indicates cancer? So this is simply going to be cancer yes times cancer yes test yes. Okay, and then it says here round to three decimal places is needed. So number form numerator divided by denominator, denominator, infinity three. Okay, so that probability is 0 0.664. Wonderful. Now, what is the probability of a person having cancer given that the test does not indicate cancer. So here, we're going to have to change stuff. So you know what I'm going to do? Um, clear numerator and denominator. Let's start over again. Let's start with, you know, brand new values for the numerator variable and the denominator variable. Okay. So for this one here, I'm assuming the test does not indicate cancer, okay? So the denominator is going to be uh, cancer yes times cancer yes test no plus cancer no times cancer no test no, okay? Because here I'm interested in, you know, what is the probability of a person having cancer given that the test does not indicate cancer? So that's why I'm, I'm using these probabilities, you know, test no, test no, cancer yes, test no, cancer no, test no. And then the numerator is going to be... Okay, so we're dealing... What is the probability of a person having cancer? So that's going to be simply cancer yes times cancer yes test no. Okay. So number form numerator divided by denominator infinity. And let me see, I think... Um, Pearson is asking for six decimal places. Six decimal places of precision. Okay. So that. Okay, so then that's going to be 0 0.000618. Okay, yay, input is correct. The input is correct. Score a hundred percent. Okay, the input is correct. Score a hundred percent. Okay. And by the way, if you look at these probabilities, um, so let's say your test comes back positive for cancer. There's only about a two-thirds chance that you actually do have cancer. So look at these probabilities. Based on these results, what is the probability of a randomly chosen person having cancer given that the test indicates cancer or is positive for cancer? 
So look at this. This is just about approximately two-thirds more or less. That's approximately two-thirds. So if your test indicates cancer, you know, there's a two-thirds chance that you do have cancer, but there's also a one-third chance that you really don't, okay? You know, and that's exactly why um, it's important to repeat these tests. You know, these tests have to be repeated in order to get an answer that is as close as possible to 100% reliable. So here, you know, then you get into the reliability of these medical tests, and that's a whole area of medical research. You know, so it's, uh, it's important. If you're doing medical research, if you're a doctor, a pharmacist, you know, a biologist, and you're involved in medical research or pharmaceutical research, believe it or not, you really have to know a lot of statistics. Um, it is very important, okay? And then here, what is the probability of a person having cancer given that the test does not indicate cancer? Well, that's a pretty small probability, right? You know, that's a very... Um, if the person actually does have cancer, okay, um, the probability of a false negative result is very, very small. It's very, very small, right? So then just to be sure, you know, this test would have to be repeated, um, you know, at least one more time, maybe even two more times, right? Okay. So that should be correct, and let's move on to the next problem. Okay. So it says here, data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics indicates that in a certain month, 30.1% of the labor force um, had a high school diploma or fewer years of education. 26.3% had some college or an associate's degree, and 43.6% had a bachelor's degree or more education. Of those with a high school diploma or fewer years of education, 9.5% were unemployed. Of those with some college or an associate's degree, 3.7% were unemployed. And of those with a bachelor's degree or more education, 2.7% were unemployed. Find the probability that a randomly chosen labor force participant has a high school diploma or less education given that he or she is unemployed. Okay, so again, this is another Bayes' theorem problem. Okay, so um, let's see. High school, um, high school or less, but let, I'll just name the variable high school. Um, okay, so it's 30.1%, so 0 0.301. And then we could say some college. Um, and that's 0 0.263, 0 0.263, college degree, um, and that's 0 0.436, 0 0.436. Okay, so of those with a high school diploma or fewer years of education, so unemployment, okay. So here we have high school, unemployment, um, what was that percentage? That was 9.5%. Oops. There we go. And then um, for some college people, their unemployment rate 
was 3.7%, which is 0 0.037. And then the college degree unemployment, that was 2.7%. Okay. So here again, you know, I like me personally, I like to figure out the denominator first. And that's simply going to be high school times high school unemployment plus some college times some college unemployment plus college degree times college degree <coughs> times unemployment. Okay, Chachki, stop. Ugh. Okay. Let me make sure I'm okay here. Yeah, this looks good. And um, let's see. Find the probability that a randomly chosen labor force participant has a high school diploma or less education, given that he or she, oh, given that he or she is employed, not unemployed. Okay. Okay. So that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I have to read this very, very carefully. So it's given that he or she is employed. Which means right over here, I have to subtract. Okay, so these are these are unemployment these are unemployment statistics. So to get the employment the employment statistics, these values have to be subtracted from one. So it's going to be one minus, you know, the high school unemployment probability. This is going to be one minus the some college unemployment probability, and the same here, one minus the college degree unemployment probability. Okay, and then for the numerator, for the numerator, we're going to have simply high school high school times one minus high school unemployment okay and we're so, okay Pearson tells us type an integer or decimal round it to three decimal places as needed okay that's important Okay, so number form, numerator divided by denominator, infinity 3. So that probability is going to be 0 0.287. That should be correct. Okay, well, you can't quite see that. Um, <laughs> hold on one second. Your input is correct, so that is correct. Okay, and that's how you solve the problem. So that's pretty easy. All right. <clears throat> Let's move on to the next one, and then I'm going to pause the video because I think I'm going to have to take my dog outside. <laughs> so we're going to do. I'm going to pause for maybe um, 15 or 20 minutes. I just hope I don't lose my my um, my uh, my connection to you know Pearson's servers, but that's okay. It's a risk I'm going to have to take. So let's move on to problem number five. Okay. So problem number five reads: In a given county. Records show that of the registered voters, 45% are Democrats, 35% are Republicans, and 20% are independents. And remember, that has to add up to 100%. So I have 
you know, 45% are Democrats, 35% uh, are Republicans, and 20% are Independents. So what is 5 and 5? That's going to give me 10. Carry the 1, and 1 plus 4 is 5, plus 3 is 8, plus 2 is 10. So the whole thing adds up to 100%, which is what I would expect, right? So these, these are, you know, these are all percentages, right? Percentages, percentages, and they all, they should all add up to 100%. So 45 plus 35 uh, well, let's see, 45 and 30 is 75, so plus 5 is 80, and then plus 20 gives me 100. The whole thing should add up to 100%, right? If it doesn't add up to 100%, that's kind of weird. Then someone made a... But then the person who wrote the problem for you, or the person who wrote the problem for, for Pearson or the textbook, that person made a mistake. <laughs> so it should add up to 1 or 100%, okay? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, let's see. In an election, 60% of the Democrats, 40% of the Republicans, and 70% of the Independents voted in favor of a Parks and Recreation Bond proposal. If a registered voter chosen at random is found to have voted in favor of this bond proposal, right, the Parks and Recreation Bond proposal, what is the probability that the voter is a Republican? an independent, a Democrat. Okay, so let's figure that out. Okay, so Republicans, let's see. Um, okay, Republicans are 35%, and Democrats, that would be 45% are Democrats. 35% are Republicans and 20% are Independents. Independents would be 20%. Okay. And then we have here Republicans bond, well, Republicans voted yes. To the bond proposal um, in an election, okay, it's 40% of the Republicans. Democrats, Democrats voted yes, and that's going to be 60% of the Democrats, okay, 60% of the Democrats. Um, and then 70% of the independents. So independents voted yes, and that's going to be 70%, 70 percent of the independents, okay? Okay, so again, my denominator is gonna be uh, common to all, th the denominator is common to all three probabilities, and that's simply going to be uh, let me see. Republicans times Republicans voted yes plus Democrats times Democrats voted yes plus Independents times Independents voted yes. So let's see, and in all three cases, we're supposed to round to three decimal places. So number form, numerator divided by denominator. Oh, the numerator hasn't been defined yet, sorry. Okay, so that's going to be, let's see, the first one, Republicans, okay. Republicans times Republicans voted yes divided by denominator, infinity 3, okay, so that's going to be 0 0.255, number form, 
Democrats times Democrats voted, uh, yeah, voted yes, divided by denominator. And that's infinity three. And that's going to be 0 0.491. And then the end, let's see, so, oh no, that's, wait a minute. Ugh. Okay, Democrats are, the Democrats are down here, so 0 0.491. And this, okay, these are the Republicans. Okay, and then finally the independents. Okay, so number form independence times independence. Wait a minute. Independence times independence voted yes divided by denominator and then infinity three. And that's going to be 0 0.255. And then let's see if we are correct. Your input is correct, score 100%. Okay. Put a little, make a little smiley face there. And maybe a mustache. Well, forget the mustache. What we can do that another time. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So what's really nice about this, guys, you know, normally when you read about Bayes' theorem, <clears throat> um, you know, the authors of these books will tell you that you should draw a tree diagram, and that's okay. That that works too. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me just take a drink, quick drink of water here. <clears throat> you know, that, that works too. Tree, tree diagrams are very helpful and can help you to, you know, visualize the problem. But what's really nice about Mathematica, and really any programming language, is that if you, so, if you carefully select your variable names, <clears throat> if you carefully select variable names that you know, are appropriate for the math problem you're solving, then you may not even need any other, you know, traditional visual aid such as a tree diagram. So here, you know, to solve these problems, I'm just using Bayes' formula and I'm giving my probabilities or I'm giving my percentages variable names that are meaningful for the problem. I could use variable names like, you know, A, B, C, X, Y, Z, but those variable names are not as meaningful, and those variable names will not really help me to conceptualize or visualize the problem that I'm working on. So, you know, Mathematica is really nice because it gives you the opportunity to create user-defined variables and you can name those variables, you know, almost any way you want to. I mean, there are some restrictions on the names that you can create, but names generally can be, you know, you use any letters that you like for, for the names, you know. Uh, it's a good idea to start your variable names with lowercase letters so as to avoid a conflict <clears throat> with, you know, built-in defined function names that Mathematica has. For example, I cannot do this. You know, I cannot do this in Mathematica. D is equal to 3. Okay, symbol D is protected. It's protected. I can't, I can't create my own variable with the name D because D, Mathematica reserves this name for another function. So in general, it's a good idea to select variable names that begin with a lowercase letter. I mean, there are some exceptions to that, but in general, that's a good rule to follow when you're using Mathematica. So when you name your variables, guys, you can use any name you like, 
but in general, it's probably a good idea to, to choose a name that begins with a lowercase letter. There are some exceptions. I mean, you, you can use capital A, you know, you can use capital B, you cannot use capital C, okay, you cannot use capital D, Okay, so um, there are, you know, that's why I'm saying you're, you're safer if you just stick with variable names that begin with a lowercase letter, okay? Other than that, I mean, there aren't a lot of restrictions. There aren't a lot of restrictions. You can name your variables, you know, however you want to, okay? All right, let me actually, let me erase some of this. <clears throat> um... We can erase that, we can erase that. We don't need that, and we don't need that, okay. Okay, so yeah, we checked the answer, it's fine. Let's move on. <clears throat> okay, now, now we're getting into the expected value problems, guys, so here's the deal, I need um, I really do need to take care of my dog, so um, I'm not going to do the entire test. This is this is the last problem that I'm going to do for you guys. Okay, this is the last problem uh, with problems seven, eight, and nine, and ten. Guys, you are really on your own. Um, the last five problems of the test have to do with expected value, but they're all pretty similar to this problem, problem number six. They're all very similar to this problem, problem number six. But like I said, this has to be the last problem that I do because um, I do have some other, you know, other responsibilities. I have to take care of my students, but I also have to take care of my family, my dog, my house. I do have other responsibilities, okay? So, um... And, you know, I don't, I don't think it's right for me to do every single test problem for you. If you've been doing the homework, you should be able to do these problems yourself. Okay, I don't mind helping you guys, but I shouldn't have to do every single problem for you. That's, that's going a bit too far. <laughs> you know, you guys have to be able to study and work independently, especially since you're all, you're all adults. You're not kids anymore, okay? Okay, let's do this problem. This is going to be the last problem we do, and but just bear in mind the other problems in, in the test, problems 7 and 8 and 9 and 10, are all very similar to problem 6. They're very, very similar. Okay, <clears throat> after paying $6 to play, a pair of fair dice are rolled. That's, that's two dice and you are paid back the number of dollars corresponding to the sum of the number of dots facing up. For example, if a sum of seven turns up, seven dollars is returned to you for a net gain or payoff of one dollar. If the sum of five turns up, five dollars is, is returned to you for a net gain of negative one dollar because remember you have to pay six dollars to play the game so if five dollars gets returned to you really you've lost a dollar okay and so on what is the expected value of the game is the game fair okay so this is a little messy this problem gets a little messy but we can figure it out with some help from Mathematica okay so here's what we're gonna do um, we're gonna create a table uh, let's see, roll two dice sums, a table inside a table, okay, and we're going to have I plus J, I goes from one to six, I don't, I mean, I could do this, guys, I could say one to six, I goes from one to six, but if I'm starting out with the initial index of one, I don't have to actually write the one. I could just write the six. The one is automatically assumed, okay? Or I could do this. It doesn't really make a difference, but if I simply write the six, then the initial index of one is automatically assumed, okay? 
and then j goes from 1 to 6. Okay. Um, I'm going to end up with, you know, a list of lists, which is not, that's not quite what I want. It's a list of lists. So what I'm going to have to do is flatten this. Flatten my list of lists. Okay, so now I have a single, um, a single list. Okay, I have a single list. Uh, let me see, hold on one second. Um, oh, let me see, what would be the best way to do this? So these are all the possible sums. They range from 2 to 12 but I need to know the probabilities of each. So what I'm going to do, um, let me look something up. I haven't used this in a long time. Association, the key and the value. Okay, an association. So here, let me look this up. Click on local. Let me see. So an association is made up of key value pairs. Key value, okay, represents an association between keys and values. Normal converts an association to a list of rules. Okay, so I think I know this is one way of solving the problem. There's, okay, so I'm, okay. So let's try this. Um, well, you know, there's one thing, wait a minute. There is something, um, hold on one second. I just want to look up one thing. How do I add to an association? Hold on, hold on one second. Um, Okay, so I can use the append function to append to an association. I can use an append function, the append function to append to an association. Okay, so I think this will work. All right, I think this is one way of doing the problem. There are actually a couple of ways of doing this problem. So what we're going to do is this. Um, I'm going to create an association called, okay, probabilities, and this is, whoop, this is going to be an empty association. Let's make sure that worked. Prob <coughs> probabilities, tchotchke, enough. It's an association, okay. So I can see here that the minimum of roll two dice sums is two and the max is 12. The minimum is two, the maximum is 12. You can see it here in the list. So what I'm gonna do is this. Four, I'm gonna make up a letter, K, 2k is less than or equal to 12. And yeah, that looks good. We're going to do, uh, let me see. <clears throat> Probabilities is equal to append probabilities, and then we're going to do um, k is equal to the count. Uh, let me see here. Roll two dice sums. K divided by the length 
of roll two dice sums. Then that should be okay. Shift enter. So what does probabilities look like? Okay, so that actually looks pretty good. So you have a 136th chance of getting a sum of 2, and you have a 118th chance of getting a sum of 3. You have a 112th chance of getting a sum of 4, a 19th chance or 19th probability of getting a sum of 5, a 5 over 36 probability of getting a sum of 6, a 1 over 6 probability of getting a sum of 7. You get the idea. So these are the probabilities associated with these sums. These are the probabilities associated with the sums. The sums go from 2 to 12, and you can see the corresponding probabilities, right? You can see the corresponding probabilities, okay? And if you want the probabilities, I think what you would have to do is simply, well, let me see here. So you could do, um, yeah. So you could simply, this is, this is the way that you get, you extract the probabilities, right? So for the, for the key, this is called a key. For the key of two in my probabilities association, the, the corresponding value is the probability of 1 over 36. Okay, for 12, the corresponding value, which is the probability of getting a sum of 12, is going to be 1 over 36. And then for 8, for the key of 8, um, you would have you know, the corresponding value, which you can see here, is going to be 5 over 36. That's 5 over 36. Okay. So then, what you would need to do, um, so we would take, okay, hold on. Uh, let me pause the video for just a moment. Pause. Okay, so... Um, then what we have to do is this. We have to remember that how much we actually win, how our net gain is going to be, it's going to be um, the amount, it's going to be the sum, the sum minus $6, right? So for, well, actually, um, if the sum is, it says here, if the sum of five turns up, five dollars is returned for a net gain of negative one dollar. So it's five minus six, seven minus six is one. So it's minus six. It's actually going to be minus six. Okay, so to, you're going to actually take the net gains times these correspond. Well, it's going to be each number, it's going to be each number um, minus six. One second, let me make sure it is. $7 is returned to you for a net gain or payoff of $1. So $7 minus $6 is $1. And if a sum of 5 turns up, it's going to be $5 is returned for a net gain of negative $1. So 5 minus 6 is negative 1, right? So it's going to be the sum. It's going to be the sum, okay, minus 6, but then times the corresponding probabilities, right? So what we're going to do is a whole new table here. Um, what should I call it? I don't know. Um, blah, 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 blah. Probabilities, probabilities 2, okay, table, and that's going to be the number k, which is going to range from 2 to 12 in steps of 1, k, uh, k minus 6 times k, and then, 
Okay, probabilities. Because remember, I want the, the values. These are the values. And k ranges from 2 to 12 in steps of 1, but the default is going to be 1. And this should be a list of the corresponding probabilities. I'm calling it probabilities 2. Shift, enter. Um, something here doesn't quite make sense. Hold on one second. K minus six. Okay, let me put, use parentheses here uh, that may make a difference. One second. Yeah, that actually makes, okay, that makes a big difference. So I have to be careful to use parentheses here because otherwise, um, yeah, it's, it's not going to make any sense. So please use parentheses over here. Okay, you really need those parentheses because otherwise the values are not going to make any sense. So then let's add up those values. And the way you do that is by using uh, applying the plus function. Plus probabilities 2. Okay, so it's going to be, you have the net gain, the expected payoff of the game is $1. It's going to be $1. Um, let me make sure of one thing though. $7 is returned to you for a net gain or payoff of $1. And if a sum Five dollars turns up. It's going to be five minus six. Okay, that should be correct. Is the game fair? The game is not fair because if it's fair, you would expect the payoff, the the expected payoff, would be zero dollars. So it says here your input is correct. Score one hundred percent. Your input is correct. Score one hundred percent. Okay. So let me, let me repeat what I did here, okay? Let me repeat what I did here for the sake of clarification. <clears throat> if you're rolling two dice, the sums are going to range from 2 to 12, which makes sense because each die contains the integers, you know, 1 to 6, okay? Because a die has six faces six sides. So if you add them up, the smallest possible sum is going to be 2, and the largest possible sum is going to be 12. So then I started with something called an association list. In uh, Python, for example, it's called a dictionary. In Ruby, in Java, it's called a hash table, but it's really the same idea. Okay? And an association or an association list in Mathematica is simply a combination. It, it, it's it's a, a, a data structure. It's a data structure that contains key value pairs. So what I did was I created an association list or an association table, whatever you want to call it, where the keys are the integers from 2 to 12, and they represent the sums of rolling two dice. And the corresponding values are the corresponding probabilities. All right, so how do you find the probabilities? Well, you simply count, you know, how many times does that sum appear in your list? And then you have to divide by the length of the list, which I believe is 36. So let's see if that's true. How long is my list? Roll two dice sums. Yeah, it's 36. Okay, so that's simple. And the K plus <clears> plus, <throat> all this means is that I'm going in steps of one. So if I start with two and end with 12, I increment in steps of one. So two, three, four, five, six, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's all the K++ actually means. 
So this is my association list. Okay. I build my table of probabilities by taking k minus 6 times the corresponding probabilities in my association list where k is an integer that ranges from 2 to 12, with 2 being the minimum and 12 being the maximum. And you do have to use parentheses here because otherwise your answer will make absolutely no sense. And then to add up your list, you simply apply the plus function. And that's how I was able to get the expected payoff of the game is $1, and the game is not fair because for, for a game of chance, for a game of chance to be fair, the expected payoff of the game has to be $0. Okay. Um, okay, guys, I think that's really going to be it. So I can submit the test, but of course we know that the last four problems are going to be marked wrong because I didn't even do them. Okay, the first six problems are correct because I answered them correctly. So if I submit my test to Pearson... Well, I'm getting the warning, you have not completed your assignment, you still have four unanswered questions. Are you sure you want to submit your assignment? That's okay, submit the test. Okay, so of course the last four questions were marked wrong, guys, because I didn't even do them. The first six questions are marked right. <clears throat> okay, so the first five questions use Bayes' theorem which is really not that difficult. It's an easy formula. It's an easy formula. It's not a big deal. The last five problems are definitely a little more challenging, but I don't think they're impossible to do. If you know what you're doing with Mathematica, and I have stressed this from the very beginning of the semester, you guys need to use Mathematica, and I, I keep on stressing that. I, I wrote it down in my syllabus. I have told you many times you need to learn the basics of Mathematica. If you know what you're doing with Mathematica, then really these probability questions should not be that difficult, okay? So I'm not going to do question 7 for you. I'm not going to do question 8 or question 9 or question 10. You're going to have to figure that stuff out yourself. If you don't want to use Mathematica, if you want to use Microsoft Excel, if you want to use a good quality calculator, if you want to use some other computational tool, you know, that's your business, that's your choice. But if you want me to help you with something, then you're going to have to use the same software that I'm using. In other words, you're going to have to use Mathematica. <coughs> um, I'm not going to help you with Excel. I don't know Excel extremely well. I know it a little bit, but I don't use Excel regularly. So I really can't provide you with much Excel tutoring. Um, if you want to use a calculator, that's your choice. If you want to use some other computational tool like Maple or MATLAB um, or, you know, Python. Again, this is entirely your choice. But if you expect me to provide assistance, if you're going to email me with questions, and if you expect me to assist you, then you're going to have to use the same software tool that I am using, and that software tool is Mathematica. And I have made that very clear to you from the very beginning of the semester. Okay? <clears throat> is Mathematica hard to use? Well, it can be, but it's, it's the type of thing that you, that you just have to study. And there are many online tutorial resources that can help you master the basics of Mathematica. You don't need a PhD in mathematics to figure out how to use Mathematica. It's really not that bad. Okay, um, that's enough for now, and um, hopefully you will do well on your probability test. Remember that it is it must be submitted before 11.59 p.m. on Thursday. So I believe that is, let me look at my calendar. <clears throat> Thursday, December 17th, your test must be submitted before 11.59 p.m. on Thursday, December 17th.
if you don't do your test by then, the grade defaults to a zero, and that's not going to be too good. Okay, so um, I think I think we're done, guys. Happy holidays, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, happy Yule, happy winter solstice, and uh, enjoy your holiday shopping, and that's it for now. Take care, and we'll talk another time. Bye-bye.